Very good afternoon to all of our viewers and welcome to what is now the final edition of this webinar series being offered each Thursday throughout the month of February entitled Living a Wild Life, Catch Me If You Can, a production of the Center for Biosecurity Studies here at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill Campus in Barbados. My name is Christiane Walcott, Operations Manager here at the Center. And has, as has been the case over the past four weeks, it is indeed my pleasure to open today's proceedings for this fourth and final episode. Before we get today's program underway, I first take this opportunity to especially acknowledge colleagues and students from around the Cave Hill campus and the wider UE community, distinguished members of the advisory committee for the Center for Biosecurity Studies, some of whom may be joining later, all collaborators and stakeholders of this Caribbean Wildlife Initiative, you, our viewers, members of the media, and of course, today's featured panelists for this final presentation, Professor Julia Horrocks, Professor of Conservation Ecology here at the UE Cave Hill campus and Director of the Barbados Sea Turtle Project. Professor, professor Christopher Ura, Professor of Veterinary Virology at the School of Veterinary Medicine at the UE St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. Ms. Frances Blair, Senior Manager for Spatial Planning at the National Environment and Planning Agency, NEPA, in Jamaica. And Mr. Ricardo Miller, Environmental Coordinator, also with the National Environment and Planning Agency in Jamaica. We welcome you all. To those of you who are returning viewers to this series, as always, we warmly welcome you back and particularly so for today's final edition. Whether you've been with us from the first presentation on February 4th, saw a subsequent flyer or heard about it from colleagues and decided to join us along the way. We are certainly grateful to have had you with us for this journey. And more importantly, we're grateful that you saw something or heard something that was sufficiently riveting to have held your interest over these past few weeks. We know that this has been a significant time commitment for everyone involved and it has not gone unnoticed or unappreciated. For those of you who are joining us today for the first time, we especially welcome you because we want to make sure that no one has been left behind in this public advocacy program. And for anyone who wants to go back and view previous presentations in this month's series, Living a Wild Life, Catch Me If You Can, whether you would like a refresher on the issues addressed by earlier panelists, or if you'd like to catch up on any episodes that you missed, Please do remember that you can visit the official website of the Center for Biosecurity Studies at www.cavehill.uwi.edu forward slash biosecurity to view the three previous talks. Alternatively, you can send an email to the address biosecurity at cavehill.uwi.edu. That's biosecurity at cavehill.uwi.edu if you'd like to access presentation material from any previous forum. And uh, we can arrange accordingly for the relevant presenter to get that if material to you. Those who are already acquainted will be aware that this four-part series has been an outreach campaign to inform and educate the public about this collaborative study known as the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative and all that it promises to the region by way of research outputs, potential policy prescriptions, practical solutions to existing problematic processes and protocols, or lack thereof, and additionally, the imminent rollout of professional short courses to be offered through the Center for Biosecurity Studies. And so, as we build upon the concepts covered in the three previous webinars, biosecurity implications of Caribbean wildlife on health, border security, tourism, trade and economy in week one, global and regional views of illegal wildlife trade and wildlife crime in week two, and One Health, wildlife hunting and consumption in the Caribbean in week three. The series climaxes today with the fourth and final theme of urban and rural development, land use changes, human and wildlife interactions, and the impacts of all of these. Once again, a warm welcome to our viewing audience. And at this time, I now invite Dr. Kurt Douglas, Director of the Center for Biosecurity Studies to introduce our panel of presenters and to moderate the rest of this afternoon's program. So Director, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Christiane. And a warm welcome to all of you who tuned in this afternoon. And many thanks to all of you um, for supporting us through the month of February with the four events that we've had planned 
in our Living a Wildlife Catch Me If You Can series, which highlights um, our Caribbean Wildlife Initiative here at the Center for Biosecurity Studies at the UWI KFL campus. Yes, and we've started to put up a poll here, and I would like um, as many as you can to please um, complete this poll as this helps us within our outreach um, initiative. Now, we've taken a journey in exploring the relationship between humans and wildlife here in the Caribbean. Keenly aware of the staggering statistic of a 95, 94 rather, the percent decline in wildlife populations in the Caribbean and Latin America, as is stated in the 2020 WWF Living Planet Report, and that's the World Wildlife Fund. The apparent links to the genesis of this current pandemic and several other previous infectious disease outbreaks also highlight the critical nature of this problematic relationship. In our public lecture, we have taken a holistic view of this relationship, examining the risk to wildlife, between wildlife, uh, wildlife to humans, and also the risk of humans and nature to wildlife, highlighting the interconnectedness with climate change, waste management and pollution, and our fragile economic dependency on tourism. Now, early human activity in the Caribbean involved the clearing of forest areas for human settlements and small scale agriculture with exploitation of wildlife for food and products. Changes in land use following colonialization increased pressure on natural habitats for cultivation and increased wildlife trade. Urban areas have increased in size and coastal areas have been developed for tourism. These changes have displaced wildlife and increase the frequency of human to wildlife interactions. Under these circumstances, wildlife can become agricultural pests, occupational hazards, peri-domestic pests, much like bats and rats and mice, and introduced wildlife can become invasive alien species. The COVID-19 pandemic and several other infectious disease outbreaks are riveting reminders of the dangers to human health posed when wildlife and humans are brought into close contact. Caribbean diversity is a critical natural resource and provides irreplaceable ecological services, but it also poses risks for public health, food security, economic security, and national security. We also see current examples of the risk posed by wildlife to humans in the recent high alert that was issued yesterday for yellow fever in Trinidad and Tobago given the observation of yellow fever infections in monkeys in Southern Trinidad, and what this means for our human population with falling immunity, which is now estimated at around 89.2%, where a 95% coverage, and that's vaccination coverage, is a WHO recommended level of vaccination to protect the population. Or even closer to home, right here in Barbados, with the circulation of a video of a troop of wild monkeys roaming in a residential area, which caused the expression of an opinion on a local calling radio program by a caller that consumption of monkeys may prove to be a viable option for reducing the wild monkey population in Barbados. This opinion was seemingly supported by the individual's previous experience of wild, of wild meat consumption, and this is monkey meat, in Trinidad and Tobago as proof of its viability. So this underscores the relevance of this initiative in improving our knowledge and understanding of what harms we can be exposing ourselves to with our actions, whether it is directly interacting with wildlife through wildlife trade, wildlife hunting, and wild meat consumption, or indirectly through human activity, such as urban and rural planning, pollution, and inadequate waste management, logging, mining, and oil exploration, that can all displace wildlife through habitat destruction or reduction in wildlife populations. Wildlife provides vital ecosystem services that help mitigate climate change and BHC dispersal, pollination, or even the maintenance of the food web. So today we will be examine the, examining rather the convergence of our national and regional economic development pursuits and Caribbean wildlife protection. Now, economic development is a worthy pursuit of all countries, but so too is the 
conservation of wildlife and our delicate ecosystems. This can be viewed as an adequate balance between, as we say, bush and business, or lives and livelihoods. One is not mutually exclusive of the other, but the economic value of our wildlife and ecosystems needs projection and certainly louder voices to achieve this balance. And the real beauty of economics is that it is certainly more than pure numbers and metrics like GDP and inflation rates, but at its very core, it is about improving the quality of life for each individual. Achieving such balance permits us to enjoy this quality of life. So our perspective and perhaps our approaches may need to be examined or re-examined and even refined. So we look forward to some deeper insights into how we can certainly go about achieving this critical balance to the benefit of all. And I will introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Julia Horrocks. And Prof Professor Horrocks is a tremendous example of this voice amplification and projection on the economic value of our Caribbean wildlife well species, giving her a spectacular track record and service to not only Barbados, but also to the Caribbean. Professor Horrocks was and still is one of the finest ecologists, certainly at the UWI, and I would even say in the world. I have fond memories of her classes from undergraduate studies. She was always a kind, jovial, and pleasant individual. In fact, her husband, Professor Wayne Hunt, who I also have very fond memories of with island ecology in my undergrad studies, certainly er illustrates the appreciation of the value of our Caribbean wildlife and our relationship with wildlife. And this has proven to be truly their family business and a way of life. Professor Horrocks is, is the director of the Barbados Sea Turtle Project and coordinator of White Cast Marine Turtle Tagging Center, which provides training in tagging technologies and archives data for over 20 sea turtle projects in the Caribbean region. She is a member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature Marine Turtle Specialist Group, IUCN MTGS and sits on the scientific committee of the Inter-American Convention for the Protection and Conservation of Sea Turtles, IAC. She's also the chair of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, the Society's Scientific Authority, and the Biodiversity Committees here in Barbados. She has authored dozens of peer-reviewed scientific articles, management and technical reports, and popular articles. She was honored by the Governor General's, with, sorry, with the Governor General's Environmental Award in 2001 for her work in conservation of biodiversity, especially sea turtles, and was awarded with the internationally prestigious Pew Marine Conservation Fellowship in 2004 to further her sea turtle research and conservation work in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. Professor Horrocks's early research focused on the acquisition and maintenance of rank within the matrilineal dominance hierarchy that characterizes green monkey social organization. This is the chlorocebus sabius. Her interest in foraging behavior led into more applied research areas investigating methods to control monkey crop damage. Her current research and those of her graduate students includes investigations of the stock structure, population ecology, nesting and migratory behavior of hawks, bills, and green turtles in the Eastern Caribbean, and mitigation of the effects of coastal development on nesting behavior, nest success, and hatchling thickness. And Professor Horowitz will present on the topic, human wildlife interactions, trade in wildlife and its impacts on Caribbean diversity. I give the floor now to you, Professor Horrocks. Thank you very much, Kirk, for that introduction. Um, the topic of uh, my, my short presentation today actually um, 
touches a little bit on monkeys and sea turtles, but the focus really, as you can see, is uh, the impacts of wildlife trade on Caribbean biodiversity. So I want to begin just very briefly to make a couple of points about um, basically, you know, why the region is as rich in biodiversity as it is um, before I get into the subject of, of trade. And the Caribbean, as you can see, more than 7,000 islands, if you count all the um, islands, islets and keys, and it has a very complex um, geological history, um, tectonic processes, lots of different tectonic processes associated with moving plates uh, against each other and subducting underneath each other, as well as um, changes in sea level. And uh, our islands have been formed by very many different processes. So Trinidad has you know, broken off the South American continent, St. Vincent is volcanic, and Barbados is uh, an example of a, an island which is an accumulation of sediments at a plate um, subduction zone. And also we, we see changes in sea level exposing the Grenadine Islands from the Grenada Bank. So the islands, they, they vary a lot in age, size, um, the distance from continents, and of course other islands. And so their topography and their rainfall, the vegetation uh, is very variable. And the animals that have arrived um, on these islands have been influenced by their capacity for active dispersal, whether they can fly, um, whether they can withstand long periods of uh, transport over water. And of course, you know, where the, the islands are in relation to wind and water currents. So new species have evolved um, in our region, which are found nowhere else on earth. And some of these are regional um, endemics and others are single island endemics. So we really do have a, a wonderful um, area in terms of biodiversity. So a very small area, however. So the Caribbean islands only make up about 0.15% of the Earth's land area. And, uh, but they are rich in endemic species and they were a lot richer um, in the past. Um, the um, illustration on the right shows you some of the, um, the large uh, diurnal mammals that used to be found in our region, uh, monkeys and giant sloths and, and some of the smaller ones, the selenodon down there and the, um, and the hutias. Unfortunately, a lot of these have disappeared, um, but we do have still uh, an impressive array of endemic species. So we have um, 51 um, mammals, um, 35 of which are bats, and this is because uh, bats are nocturnal and much more inaccessible to, to humans. And we have a very rich array of uh, reptiles and, um, of course, a very large um, number of uh, endemic seed plants, more than 7,500. So it is a very, very rich and uh, uh, wonderful area. And that makes it the Caribbean, it makes the Caribbean islands actually a biodiversity hotspot. So it has the minimum 1500 endemic vascular plants, uh, which, you know, makes the biota irreplaceable because it's endemic. And um, it also has 30% or less than 30% of the original natural vegetation remaining. So it's very, very threatened. And those are the two factors which um, uh, make it a, a biodiversity hotspot. So the threats to biodiversity, um, we know them as overexploitation, uh, loss of habitat, invasive alien species and climate change. Um, really uh, human interactions with wildlife, um, um, humans use biodiversity as a, as a natural resource, uh, but history shows that we very often use it up much faster than it can be renewed. Um, and also, of course, when we move into an area, um, we have a very significant impact in terms of habit habitat modification or loss, and then end up bringing um, into the region species that we're familiar with, uh, which causes, um, uh, well, sometimes we do it deliberately and sometimes we do it accidentally, but the, the end result is that 
we end up introducing species that can turn out to be invasive. And of course, finally, climate change. But my focus really is on, on trade and on trade in animals rather than plants. And um, the first humans to settle the Caribbean islands were the Taino and the Kalinago. And these were seafaring people who moved between the islands um, very frequently. They were, you know, they had, they were obviously, obviously very talented makers of canoes and they moved between the islands uh, freely. And they carried with them um, all kinds of things, raw materials, um, flint, salt, um, and of course, animals, which they were familiar with, they brought with them. And um, you can see in the picture on the left, a very lovely macaw. Um, these parrots and macaws were an important part of, of the culture of these peoples and, and uh, were very often um, traded and exchanged or, or traded. Um, so about the time that people arrived in the islands of the Caribbean, we saw um, the extinction of some of the um, very charismatic um, large diurnal megafauna. Um, the things like the, um, the ground sloths disappeared and you can see um, on the low left, you can see a Taino tool, which is made from the claw of one of these sloths just to give you an idea of how big they really were. And these were in trade. Um, you can also, and the notable thing about these, um, these species is that they, they are diurnal um, and they were not afraid of humans they'd never experienced them before. So they were very easy, slow moving animals, very easy to overexploit. Um, there was also monkeys in the Great Antilles. Some of you uh, may know that already or may not, but um, the monkeys we think were um, rather slow moving and sloth like and they too would have been relatively easy to overexploit and also, of course, um, be impacted by um, any changes um, to the habitats. But it was with the arrival of the Europeans that many more species went extinct. And um, just you know, to give you some more statistics, Kurt mentioned a few, but sadly, since the 1500s, the extinctions of 10% of the Earth's birds, 38% of its mammals, and 60% of its reptiles have occurred in the Caribbean. So really this region has suffered tremendous, uh, a tremendous level of extinction. Um, and the, the image shows you some of, this is from 1667 in Guadeloupe, and you can see there Amazona parrots, you can see frigate birds, you can see macaws, and of course, um, sea turtles. Um, but what happened was, although the uh, Amerindians had traded parrots, it was not nearly at the scale as had ha as happened with the Europeans, who of course brought with them guns. Um, they were also able uh, to set up um, trade relationships with Europe and things like parrot feathers, macaw feathers became very popular as um, ornaments for your hat, your cloak um, and parrots, because they could talk and were very colorful, became status symbols. And this caused severe overexploitation of these animals in the region. Um, I put this and it put this creature in the Caribbean monk seal because it's one of the very few marine mammals that have been driven to extinction by humans. And it was a, a seal which was endemic to our region. And uh, as you can see, um, it was the oil that. Uh, spelt the demise for this animal. The oil was used in lamps and was also used to lubricate um, plantation machinery. And you can see um, that 1688 report, hundreds of seals being killed. Well, you know, you can't withstand that, that level of overexploitation. Um, sea turtles were traded and have, have been traded for thousands of years, but with the arrival of Europeans, again, international trade routes were set up. And um, some of it involved trade in live animals, particularly green turtles, which were sent to England. Um, but the, the trade in hawksbills really increased when the value of the shell um, became a luxury it became a luxury essential on international markets. And you can see it in the top right there, 
that's a piece of the shell held up against the light. Um, it's called Beko in Japan because Japan was a major importer of, of shell from our region. And in fact, millions of turtles uh, died as a consequence of this, of this shell trade. And if hawksbills and other sea turtles had not been put on Appendix 1 of CITES, um, then these animals would have been lost to us. So trade um, has had a very significant impact on um, species of sea turtles. Um, you can see how the landscape was transformed. Uh, this is Barbados and uh, trees were cut down by the end of, well, by the late 1600s, uh, most of the trees had, had gone and any land that was cultiv cultivatable was cultivated. And because it's a flat island, that meant that the majority of uh, forest was lost. Um, and this, you know, the, the, the trade, the transatlantic trade and the movement of peoples between Europe and, and, uh, and the Caribbean led to the accidental introduction of species like rats and mice. Um, and uh, the, the islands had their own native species of rice rats and no doubt black and brown rats were competitors for those animals. But they also, um, there was also a lot of deliberate introductions and um, the green monkey is probably one of the most notable ones, which was introduced to Barbados, St. Kitts, Nevis, St. Martin, and, and possibly St. Lucia. Um, and uh, along with the green monkeys, uh, they came from West Africa. The raccoons came from North America, again, introduced very early in, into Barbados. And you can see that there was an act for destroying wild monkeys and raccoons passed in the 1680s. So already they were a crop pest. Um, the Mona monkey there you can see on the right is a more arboreal species. It lives more in the trees, less, uh, uh, less inclined to come down to the ground and perhaps not as much of a, a crop pest in Grenada as the green monkey is in uh, Barbados and St. Kitts. Um, what we don't know much about is what their impacts were on the native biota when they arrived in the islands. Um, very unfortunate. You know, it was a long time in the past, and it happened at a time when the islands were basically devastated um, by the action of clearing forests for cultivation. And so, you know, their own particular impact was probably lost amongst the impact caused by the landscape changes. Um, but anyway, they've adapted to live on, alongside humans and they feed on crops um, in these heavily altered environments. Um, in the sort of in the 1900s, for most of the 1900s, the landscape was, was similar to this. Um, in more recent years, we've we've seen reforestation going on in Barbados and uh, a, the change in the distribution of movements uh, of animals. Um, but there's no doubt that they have a heavy reliance on crops uh, because that was the food that was available to them when they arrived, and they're highly adaptable species. So with all this, um, this um, uh, agriculture, of course, um, there were problems with pests. And here are two uh, species that were introduced, a uh, small Indian mongoose, which I'm sure everybody knows about, has driven to extinction or threatened so many native species. Uh, the list is very, very long, but I, there's a couple of them there on the right-hand side. Um, originally introduced um, to control rats, but uh, rats are largely nocturnal and mongoose are diurnal, and so has, um, has had a very significant impact on, on diurnal, diurnal species. And then on the left, we have the cane toad, which was introduced to control sugarcane insect pests, has a very high rate of reproduction, um, and it also has um, this uh, buffer toxin, which means that when it's eaten, um, it can poison uh, whatever uh, predator has consumed it. And my colleague, um, Byron Wilson, at the Mona campus, um, I think has documented for the first time an impact of the cane toad on Caribbean fauna, um, and on, in this um, case, on the Jamaican boa, which has not learned that uh, it's a good um, animal to avoid. Um, okay, so I, I just want to mention some more recent um, introductions, some 
um, which uh, are the consequence of present day trade practices um, where things are introduced really for aesthetic or recreational type reasons. Um, and along with tourism um, and a lot of landscaping that has gone on, we've seen the um, importation of a lot of um, species of plants which tend to be often more colorful um, and effectively kind of seduce um, our pollinating species away from our native plants, um, lowering the pollination rates of native plants, and also sometimes even leading to eggs being laid on the wrong plants for the caterpillars uh, of that butterfly species. But along with that have come, has come, you know, with the soil and the, you know, the plants um, have come things like the flowerpot snake to Barbados, Ramphotiflops, and we suspect that this is um, likely to become a competitor for our endemic worm or thread, thread snake, which is arguably um, the smallest of these um, snakes in the region. So the introduction of animals um, for the pet and the aquarium trade, and again, sticking with um, Barbados, these are all um, fairly recent introductions to the region, some of which have been accidentally introduced um, through, um, well, for exa example, the um, lionfish, which uh, originally was an escapee from an aquarium up in Florida or the Bahamas, uh, has become invasive in our region. Um, but uh, some things like the ringneck parakeet um, and the collared dove, uh, which are, um, originally came from escaped species, uh, escaped uh, individuals escaping into the wild and uh, forming breeding populations. The ringneck parakeet is a, is a crop pest and the collar dove, you know, there's some concern that it may become um, a, a competitor for the zonada dove. Uh, it certainly is a lot more dominant and aggressive than the zonada dove. Um, and then we have, um, we have the introduction of the green iguana in the middle there. And um, we don't have a native iguana. So, you know, what exactly the impact will be in Barbados, it, it's hard to say, but they too are crop pests. And then in the bottom right, you may have heard recently on the, on the news, there was talk of uh, this um, animal, the amoeba lizard. And we do have a ground lizard, Kentropix, which is a native species. And there is some concern that perhaps amoeba uh, may become competitor for that species. So just my last couple of slides, I just want to mention collecting. Um, so I'm distinguishing the collectors from people who just want to keep these animals as pets. Collectors are really seeking out rare species and they are reading the scientific literature and they are um, making themselves, uh, educating themselves about where rare species are found and then really seeking them out and um, providing a market um, for these animals. And a very popular species in, um, in people's collections are, are the iguanas. And the region has a native species, Iguana delicatissima, um, which you can see on the right. Um, and there is some, um, some work has been done to suggest that the delicatissima in some of our islands um, are in fact distinct species um, and will have their own name. And of course, the, they exist at, at very, very small population sizes. And that, that makes them very rare, that makes them very collectible, that makes them uh, very uh, rewarding for people who get into that kind of trade. Um, so on the other hand, we have the iguana iguana, which is the green iguana, which um, has been introduced um, either accidentally, it's arrived in the islands. Uh, for instance, uh, a bunch of green iguanas arrived in Anguilla from Guadeloupe um, back in the 1990s as a result of um, movement due to hurricanes. But a lot of them are escaped pets. And these iguanas, they breed prolifically they are going to compete with our native iguanas. Um, they're going to be crop pests. Uh, they're, they're all kinds of trouble for, for the Caribbean region. 
So I just wanted to leave with this beautiful feature. This is the Union Island gecko. And I think that Kirk showed a, an image of this in the, in the first talk. Um, this is an animal which is only found in one bay uh, in Union Island. It's extremely rare and it's extremely beautiful. And of course, it's in great demand um, by collectors. St. Vincent very fortunately has um, had this um, animal put on Appendix 1 of CITES, the CITES Convention, and so that is hopefully going to protect it uh, somewhat from, um, uh, from trade, um, but it is still under intense threat from illegal trade unless we are very, very uh, vigilant. Okay, so with trade connections increasing, the opportunities for illegal trade of native species uh, are only going to increase, as will opportunities for the introduction of, you know, the accidental introduction of species which are going to threaten our wildlife. So both of these are very important issues and both of them need to be addressed um, urgently if we are going to conserve uh, Caribbean biodiversity from the impacts of trade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hart, for a truly informative presentation. I certainly learned a lot about the history of the Caribbean and also the various species, whether they were introduced or whether they were native to our ecosystems here in the Caribbean. And um, I think what this highlights is the importance and the economic value of it, the heritage that we have here in the Caribbean and how it's been depleted, not only within the last couple of decades, but for many centuries. And it is important that we improve that relationship between humans and wildlife here in the Caribbean. And so I, would like now to introduce our next speaker who would be uh, Mr. Ricardo Miller. And he is representing uh, the National Environmental Protection Agency in Jamaica. And he will be presenting on the topic environmental management perspective of Caribbean wildlife and human development practices in Jamaica. Mr. Ricardo Miller is an environmental coordinator at the National Environmental Environment sorry, and Planning Agency, uh, a member of BirdLife Jamaica, and for the past five years, the operator of Arrowhead Birding Tours. He is a lively and enthusiastic birder and a great person to go on a birding expedition with. He leads a NEPA unit, which is responsible for the management of animal species in Jamaica. The ecosystems branch as a whole looks at the management of the natural environment, meaning its flora and fauna with specific objectives to conserve the island's rare, endangered and endemic species. A lot of their work is focused on endangered species such as some birds, snakes, crocodiles and iguanas. A major objective is to develop management plans for these protected or endangered species with specific actions needed to improve their population status. Mr. Miller has obtained a BSc, Bachelor's of Science in Zoology, Animal Biology from the University of the West Indies, this is at Mona campus, and a Master's of Science degree in Marine and Terrestrial Ecology. And now I present to you, Mr. Ricardo Miller. You have the floor, sir. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. Um, can you please confirm that you're hearing me properly? Yes, I am. I'm hearing you crystal clear. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I, as you, as you mentioned, I will be doing a presentation this afternoon on environmental management of Caribbean wildlife and human development practices looking at the, um, the Jamaica perspective. Now, I would like to share my screen. Let me go ahead and do that. And share my 
see my screen in a second now. Okay, good. Um, first, I must thank Professor um, Julia Parks for her presentation because she did pretty much half the job for me in giving an overview of the biodiversity within the region. So I'm going to try and zoom in a little bit on the Jamaican perspective. And so first I'm gonna start with a fairly broad overview. Now, Jamaica is the third largest English speaking country in the Western hemisphere um, behind US and Canada. At the same time, we're also the third largest Caribbean island behind Cuba, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico. And these actually help to shape who we are in terms of as a people culturally and in terms of our biodiversity and how we as a people interact with that biodiversity. Because Jamaica, for example, is being an English speaking Caribbean island, but the only English speaking Caribbean island of the four big islands does create some form of challenges, does create some form of opportunities um, and some rather unique situations. Now, our history, of course, is that, you know, we were former British colonies and our population is about 92%, you know, African-American descendants and Jamaica has a rich cultural heritage. I need not say more about that. Every, every corner of the world, you'll hear about Jamaica. So these help to shape who we are. And for our international viewers, um, that is Jamaica, right there circled in the middle of the Caribbean right there. And it's the only English speaking Caribbean island of the four big islands. Now, Jamaica's biodiversity is largely dependent on the habitats that we have. We have a very diverse terrestrial ecosystem, for example. We have limestone forests, we have alluvial forests, we have shale forests, you know, broad, wet broadleaf forests, and so forth. We have a very diverse coastal and marine ecosystem. We can think about our wetlands or seagrass beds or coral reefs, and the list goes on. But one of the things that Jamaica is known for is our high biodiversity. And that is not unique to Jamaica by no stretch of the imagination. But within the Caribbean, or rather within the world, we are ranked fifth among islands in terms of plant endemism. We are considered a biodiversity hotspot for forests, um, forest species. We can think of places like the John Crow Mountains and the Cockpit Country, which are probably our two most um, rich, most lush forested areas that remain on the island. And you'll hear a little bit more about the cockpit country in particular as I, as I go on. Now, a little bit more background. We have over 500 species of land snails, right? With 98% of those being endemic. And that just looking at that alone gives you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of being an island and being, having a lot of unique species. I know snails are you know, not the most charismatic of species, but it gives the perspective of what is going on on the islands. We have 22 species of native amphibians. All of them are endemic. You know, we have 43 reptiles on the island. 77% of them are endemic. We have 29 actually recognizing 31 endemic species of birds. And we actually lost two um, that went extinct due to introduction of, of um, exotic species and of habitat loss and so forth and some of the things that, that the professor mentioned in the earlier presentation. Jamaica also boasts the largest butterfly in the Western Hemisphere, which is called the Homer swallowtail. Um, it's also called the Jamaican giant swallowtail, but there are so many species that people consider a giant swallowtail butterfly, but the proper name is the Homer swallowtail. In terms of the flora, we have over 3,000 species of flora and plants. Um, just over a quarter of those are endemic, 230 species of orchids, and so forth and so forth. I won't bore you too much on, on all the diversity, um, the biodiversity that's going on on the island, but you get the picture. Now, what has happened is that there is a lot of threat to this biodiversity. You see, I have climate change separate and apart from those lists of threats, because climate change itself is sort of a more of an overarching concept that is affecting not just Jamaica, but it's affecting the entire globe. So climate change would, would um, get its own attention. 
But looking at these five things that I have listed here, habitat destruction, poaching, number one and two, those are probably two, um, the two biggest threats to the, to the biodiversity in Jamaica. We have a lot of habitat loss, unfortunately, poor development. Um, the, the country in the past, I would say 15 years, has been undergoing some rather rapid development, especially along our coastlines in terms of hotels, in terms of new cruise shipping piers, and internally, in terms of mining, we've been expanding our bauxite mining, for example. You know, we've been mining bauxite for 60, 70 years, and most of the easy bauxite, I would say, is gone. And so we have to be going into now less traditional areas, areas that we would rather have protected. There, there are no threats of bauxite mining. And we'll get a little bit more into that further on. Of course, there's alien invasive species, which the professor touched on. We talk about the rose ring parakeet. Um, we talk about, you know, the mongoose and so forth. And I mentioned that the mongoose at least is, is partially responsible for the loss of at least two bird species on the island. There's also pollution. And of course, there's exploitation, over-exploitation of our, of our resources. Now, that's a quick look at the cockpit country. It is central, central western section of Jamaica and probably the most interior part of the island, I would say. And it, it is a thick and lush forest that is mostly untouched in certain areas. And that is where the bulk of all the biodiversity I spoke of earlier occurs. You know, so, and in addition to the biodiversity, it's also important for our water resources. You know, it's a wet limestone forest. A lot of our large rivers originate in this area. So there is, so there is this need to protect the carpet country. And you can see in the bottom right corner, there's a slogan. So when there was talk of mining the carpet country, this mobilized the communities in and around the carpet country and Jamaica as a whole to say, hey, this is part of our heritage. We're looking at our future. We need to come together and look at this more holistically. And so that is what happened, I would say, between five and 10 years ago. And in more recent times, what has happened is that the government actually came out and said there will be no mining in the cockpit country. But again, it is not as clear cut as that because the biggest controversy in this particular scenario is what is the cockpit country? And that has been the hottest debate topic in terms of defining what we consider to be the, the cockpit country. And in this picture of, of the, um, the map of the cockpit country, there are several maps overlapping. And so there are various ideas of what the cockpit country is. There's the ideas about it being much larger based, taking into, uh, take into account a lot of the cultural aspects of what made the cockpit country the cockpit country. Um, there is also just the morphological aspects and so forth. So it was good that there was this consensus where we needed to come together to look at it holistically and try and define the cockpit country. So that is what happened. Now, with all that biodiversity that I've mentioned, we've actually lost a few things. You know, we lost a racer, we lost a large gallo wasp, uh, which was about two feet long. Um, we lost a Jamaican rice rat, the two species of birds I mentioned, the Jamaican petrel, Jamaican paraki. Um, we lost the uniform creek. That wasn't endemic, but it was on the island. The golden swallow was on the island, but it wasn't endemic. It still persists in the um, it still persists in the Dominican Republic. And you know, there are other species that we've lost. No, there are also species that we almost lost. There is the Jamaican iguana, which was rediscovered in 1990. And from that, we developed a Jamaican iguana recovery group. And so it is now one of the biggest success in terms of conservation of a reptilian species anywhere in the world. It's, it's, um, it's, it's actually a very famous project and it's ongoing from 1990 and still continues today. Um, the blue-tailed galleos, you know, we thought for a while that it might have been extinct, but once we started conserving the Jamaican iguana, for example, the blue-tailed galleos started to reappear in the forest. And this is coming out of work done by um, Professor Baron Wilson, who Professor Harrock had mentioned earlier. Um, enforcement management in the face of human development. That's, that is the, the bulk of what we want to talk about. So we, we had the overview of what the biodiversity in Jamaica is like and some of the threats that we face. 
Now, how are we managing this biodiversity? You know, a lot of time has passed. Um, we are far advanced. We, we want to think that we are wiser than, um, than you know, previous generations. And so we, we, we hope that we are able to do things a little better, a little differently. Now, in order to be managing our wildlife, our, our environment, one of the first things we need to look at is our legislation. And from that list, I can say that Jamaica is not short on legislation um, when it comes to our environment. We do have quite a lot of legislation that speaks to the environment. Um, one of the main and probably the, the most powerful one is the Natural Resources Conservation Authority Act, the NRC Act, which my agency operates under. Um, and my agency is the National Environment and Planning Agency, as Dr. Douglas mentioned. There's the Endangered Species Act, the Wildlife Protection Act, there's the Forestry Act, and so forth. So we do have a lot of legislation, but there is an argument that we are not effective at times in you know, adhering to these legislation, in holding people accountable to these legislation. And that is where enforcement comes in. So there is, and, and it's not unique to Jamaica, it's, it's something that occurs right across the region, the Caribbean region, and I would say right across the world. You know, the laws are in place, but enforcing the laws sometimes can be challenging. Now, along with the legislation, there is also the protected area system, whereas the, 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 the agency, National Environment and Climate Agency, NEPA, for example, um, can, I, can I ask you to hold one second, please, sir? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, in these days of COVID, you know, the children are home. <laughs> um, so yes, let me, let me continue. Um, so I was, I was saying that along with our legislation, one of the, the, the other management um, tool that we have is our protected area system. Jamaica has a really comprehensive protected area system that seeks to protect quite a large portion of the, of the island. You can see from that map that it, it's, a, it's a little fuzzy map, but this map wasn't there for you to really look at the individual components, but just to see that the country as a whole has a lot of areas that are shaded and bracketed off to be considered or are considered as protected areas in one shape or form. Um, we can think of the cockpit country area, which became a protected area once the, well, it is still in the process once the threat of bauxite mining was at hand. There is the Blonde Junker Mountains National Park over in the east. There, we have a large array of forest reserves. We have game reserves where there are no hunting. And, and you know, we have marine parks and so forth. So that is one big, along with the legislation, the protected area system, I would say, is one of the, the forefront programs that are there to help us to manage our, our environment. Now, along with that, there are species specific programs. I've mentioned at least one so far, the Jamaica Iguana Recovery Program. There is also the Game Birds Management Program. Um, and Game Birds Management, it's, it's, it's about hunting of species. It, it might sound counterintuitive, but it is a management process where we allow the hunters hunt the species, certain species, in this case, only four bird species within strict rules, within strict time limits, within strict bag limits. And we do research around that. We, 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 we collect a fee for a hunting permit, for example. And so that, that fee now goes back into managing the hunting season and ensuring that the population is at a level where we can have hunting. And of course, there are protocols in place, there are systems in place that would trigger certain management decisions such as, you know, shortening of the hunting season, uh, a, a lowering of the bag limit, or even a, ten, a total suspension of the hunting season, for example. So the game bird management program is one such um, conservation program that we're doing. There is the crocodile conservation program, which a colleague of mine is actively involved in. Um, there is conch management. This is actually more through the fisheries division, but the agency, NEPA, 
has a really um, important role because we are also the management authority for CITES, or local management authority that is on the island. Um, Jamaica is one of the fortunate Caribbean islands to have you know, full um, all, all the legislation in place to adhere to the, to the CITES convention where we do have a management authority as well as a scientific authority that advises the management authority. And so through those authorities, we are able to put management in place for CITES listed species. And for example, the conch, um, in recent times, however, we've been having some trouble with our conch population. And so the, this has triggered management action such as the suspension of hunting season. So although we have seen declining in the numbers, the process allows us now to have a management decision such as suspending the, the, the conch season. These programs, all these programs have written within them public education and outreach. So whether we have an iguana project or a, you know, a crocodile project, within those projects, there are public education and outreach programs. And there are also much broader species management plans that have been prepared. That is also one of my main roles at NEFA is to actually look at the species that need conservation and, and help to write and put together management plans for these. And within this plan, there's always a public education and outreach um, section. And from this, we, you know, we, we take sections and we, we put them into effect. I mentioned research. There's always ongoing research. That's my colleague, Trey Picking on the crocodile research. Um, that's actually me in my hands there holding that white crown pigeon, um, doing research on game birds where we actually have a, a pigeon that is, a few pigeons that are satellite tagged. Um, and there, that scatter plot down at the bottom is just some GPS locations of what my bird, one of my bird has been doing over the years. So there is research at various levels there, you know, there is really technical research that's going on. And we are you now able to look at not just the species itself, but how it interacts with the environment. You know, we can ask questions, is our protective area system effective in protecting these species? Now that we're looking at things like their movements and what areas they're utilizing. So research is actually a very important aspect of this program. And then we get back to enforcement. Um, I'll be finishing shortly. So the enforcement aspect of our conservation work has to look at, in particular, our borders, for example. We, we, are, we have been experiencing a lot of our indications that there are you know, smuggling activities that are occurring into Jamaica. You, we saw the presentation before talking about things like green iguanas. You know, we've been seeing persons with green iguanas and we suspect they've been illegally brought in. There are other species of animals that fall into that category. Um, birds, um, we, we've had cases where the Coast Guard, the, the Marine Police have seized vessels coming from Central America that have you know, illegal species in them, protected species, monkeys, for example, We've had a few cases of monkeys on the island, and those could only have been brought in illegally. Um, the, the picture on this particular slide is actually showing two or four endemic birds, the black-billed parrot on the top and the yellow-billed parrot to the bottom. But the grayed out background is actually the yellow-billed parrot in Austria. So this, those parrots are there out of a very public, um, enforcement action that occurred in Austria back in, I believe, 2011, where they seized smuggled eggs coming from Jamaica, 80 eggs, and they were able to bring them to the zoo and hatch them. And they found out that these were actually some of our endemic and endangered, you know, parrots. And so that was a huge, you know, eye-opener to say, you know, although we're not seeing things, it's, it's happening. You know, there is international smuggling going on. There are, there are local, um, persons who are facilitating this. And so we need to go back to the drawing board and see how we can infiltrate and better understand um, what is happening. So looking now as to what's the way forward. Well, first and foremost, it has to involve the community, it has to involve people. And the example I said earlier about the cockpit country is is a rather good example, I would say, of how the community itself came together to look at threats, 
to the biodiversity threats to their livelihoods and was able to lobby in such a powerful way that the prime minister had to come out and declare the area that there would be no mining in that area. So the way forward is to have more and more engaging opportunities like these for other species, for other areas, um, for developments that will occur. And my colleague, Ms. Francis Blair, who will be presenting later on about our process of, of you know, EIAs and, and so forth, will show that there is a, an avenue that is built in to the system for the public to, to have to be voiced, voice their opinion. Um, and there is a feedback mechanism for us to now react to their concerns. We need to have more investment in enforcement tools in our national security. And in recent times, the government has actually been doing just that. The Coast Guard, for example, has been beefed up. The Jamaica Defense Force as a whole has been expanding. And you know, we've got new ships, and we're looking at our borders, looking at how we can actually protect these resources um, that we have, because we do have a very large and very profitable fishing industry along the south coast of Jamaica, along the Pedro Bank. And, and that bank, that shallow area is, you know, is about two thirds the size of Jamaica. So it's a really large area. And so we have challenges with, with fishermen from other regions, Central America, from other parts of the Caribbean will come into our waters. So, and it's those same trade routes that will bring in, you know, illicit activities and will bring in, you know, species that shouldn't, you know, are, are controlled, our site is listed and so forth. We need a stronger bond between our Caribbean neighbors. And that is something, I mean, this, this very presentation here is, is a part of this. And of course, we need improved legislation to look at new technologies, to be able to make prosecutions in certain cases that we have using video evidence and so forth. You know, so there are quite a few steps that we have that we can um, take. And, but given what we've done so far and what we're continuing to do, I would say we are actually in fairly good standards. And that is my presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. That should say thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Miller, for an excellent presentation. Once again, very informative. And um, we learned a lot about the land of uh, wood and water. Um, and I must thank uh, Dr. Anna Perkins for forging this alliance. Uh, she was a critical person to link um, myself and the center with uh, NEPA. So thank you for that, Dr. Perkins. And I, I found it rather interesting, especially the Jamaican iguana look, um, or I don't know if it's a he or she, but the species is a very attractive species. I've never seen an iguana of that color before. So um, it's really interesting learning about the biodiversity that we have in the region. Um, so thank you very much for that. And now we will turn to the actual process um, for the urban planning and rural planning in Jamaica. And I will introduce Ms. Frances Blair, and she's the Senior Manager of Spatial Planning at the National Environment and Planning Agency in Jamaica. And she will be presenting on the topic spatial planning process in Jamaica and human development practices um, in Jamaica. Mrs. Blair is an environmental and planning professional and a senior manager at the National Environment and Planning Agency, which is the lead government entity in Jamaica with the mandate for environmental protection, natural resource management, land use, and spatial planning. She has been engaged in the preparation of land use related documents such as development orders, state of the environment report for Jamaica, as well as environmental and planning guidelines and manuals. She has conducted and supervised research in several areas, including environmental screening and assessment development process, public sensitization and participation, urban and re regional planning, as well as sustainable development issues. She has also played a role in the development of environmental and planning policies and regulations and provided technical advice on land related matters to other government and private sector entities. Ms. Blair in her capacity as senior manager has represented 
the agency at several strategic planning sessions, conferences, workshops, and seminars, both locally and internationally. As an educator, she takes pleasure in sharing her knowledge and experience with colleagues and students at the University of the West Indies and the University of Technology, where she occasionally delivers guest lectures. Her educational background includes a master's degree in natural resource management and a bachelor's of arts degree in geography and sociology from the UWI and a bachelor of science degree in integrated planning and environmental development from the University of Technology, as well as certification in environmental impact assessment from the Korea Environment Institute and Korea International Cooper Cooperation Agency of the Republic of Korea, or KOICA. As a current member and past vice president of the Jamaican Institute of Planners, she is committed to raising the profile of the planning profession in Jamaica. She is a former deputy chairperson of the Environmental Impact Assessment Committee at NEPA and is the current president of the KOICA Alumni Association, the Jamaican chapter. And I introduce to you now, Ms. Frances Blair. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Good afternoon, panelists. Good afternoon, everyone who is online listening to my presentation. I'll try to share my screen. Okay, uh, my topic today will be urban and rural planning and environmental processes in Jamaica. Okay, Ms. Blair, just, just one second. Um, I don't think your presentation has come up on the screen as yet. Could you wow. just, okay. just uh, maximize your screen and you should see a green bo button at the bottom of the screen and just share your screen there. Okay. Give me a couple of seconds to do that. No problem at all. I hope everyone is enjoying the proceedings so far. I think we are certainly learning a lot. And as Ms. Blair gets ready, I guess we can prepare. Is that better, Dr. Douglas? Yes, please, you can go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So I'll be looking at in, um, urban and rural planning and the environmental impact assessment process in Jamaica. Now, Ricardo Miller, my colleague has basically set the tone, he spoke about the different species of plants and animals that are in Jamaica and that are endemic and that are basically precious to us. So in looking at my topic, it is intended to explain how planning process and the environmental impact assessment process protect and conserve the wildlife on the island, as well as in the marine environment. So for the presentation, I'll be looking at urban and rural planning, some key points, environmental impact assessment, what development is, the different legislations that are applicable, the planning process in Jamaica, the EIA process, show the linkages between planning and environment and how that is used to protect the species. We look at the goals of the planning and environmental process, as well as failure and successes of the processes. Okay, so as it relates to rural and urban and rural planning, that process basically is a referee for land use in Jamaica. 
it, it deals with the allocation of scarce land resources, the optimal use of land for various uses, look at the long-term objectives that are available and establish. We also, um, the process allows us to examine long-term social, cultural, economic, and urban and rural development. It also provides guidance in decision-making as it relates to investment, looks at the protection and preservation and conservation of the environmental assets that we have in our country. It is a key element in sustainable development. Okay, just looking at what an environmental impact assessment is. An environmental impact assessment look at what a proposed project or the impact that the proposed project may have on the environment, as well as it looks at the environment, the impact of the environment on development. It also proposes a mitigation measures necessary to reduce negative impact. The environmental impact assessment looks also at monitoring and management and how we handle those operations during construction and what happens after construction activities. In terms of development, when we speak of development, we're talking about operational and material change of use. And this development may occur in, on, over, or on the land. And some of the examples of development activities include construction of building and structures, clearance of land and reclamation activities, mining, dredging. These are just some of the examples of development activities as defined by the, the, the law. And these are some of the applicable legislations. The NRCA Act, which Mr. Miller had previously mentioned. Next is the Town and Country Planning Act, the Building Act, the Local Improvement Act and the Mining Act. Now, all these legislation are, um, are related to planning and how, and shows how to protect the environment and the, the species therein. Okay, in Jamaica, the planning process is uh, an interactive one, meaning you may have a directive that comes from, um, it could be from the cabinet, it could be from parliament, it could be from the ministry, it could also be from the town and country planning authority or the minister in charge of the environment and planning. And that directive would be given to the National Environment and Planning Agency, which is the, is the regulatory agency and the administrative arm of the Town and Country Planning Authority. And based on our mandate, we would be involved in the plan making process, which include research, reconnaissance, visit to the area in particular that is being studied, We'd look at, um, we'd get information, collect data through surveys, interaction with stakeholders and interest group. We would um, look at consultation uh, as a part of the process and anal analysis of the information that we have collected. We would prepare the different policies or draft the different policies and present them to the relevant um, authority or groups for 
feedback and interaction as it relates to the, the policy and proposals that are presented. And those would be approved and given the, the red, um, the green light, not red light, the green light to go ahead and prepare the document itself. After the plan has been prepared and accepted, it is implemented. And as a part of the implementation, there is the development control aspect where for certain development to occur in the country, you have to submit an application. And in submitting that application, it is assessed based on certain parameters. And if it is a sound project, then we'll go ahead, we'll, the, great, the green light will be given for the project to go ahead. And after that, you'll have some monitoring and enforcement if that is required. We also assess our processes we provide feedback and out of that then we revise the plan and it goes around again so the process is a continuous one and throughout every aspect of the project you have some form of consultation interaction and feedback from whether it is the the ministry private sector um, stakeholders interest group we try to ensure that consultation is there so we hear the voice of the, the people. Now this is the process showing the environmental impact assessment. The environmental impact assessment process is done in the context of an application an environmental application, whether it's for a permit or a license. So the applicant will submit his proposal. It will be screened and a determination will be made by the agency if an environmental impact assessment is required. Therefore, further studies would have to be done. If it is determined that an EIA is required, the applicant is advised the terms of reference for the environmental impact assessment will be developed. The applicant will prepare the, prepare the environmental study. It will be submitted, it will be reviewed, and a part of the review process entails public consultation, public participation, public presentation, which is mandatory so that the views of the persons involved, stakeholders, interest group can participate in the process. After which the findings are analyzed, it is submitted to the different um, technical committees and the board for a decision to be made the permit is issued if it is granted um, by the authority it is issued to the client and the agency would monitor and enforce as required so just to point out that in the process or in this study there are certain parameters that are assessed like um, the biological um, resources, we look at the, the, um, the flora, the fauna, their possible impact, whether it is positive or negative impact on those. Um, so th those are some of the parameters we look at. We look at the water resources, um, solid waste, and how the possible impact of those on the of the project on the environment. And as I mentioned before, there are mitigation measures that are proposed in the EIA document that is intended to reduce or minimize the impact on the environment. Those are analyzed and presented and if found to be sound, then the 
permit will be issued or granted. Now, um, remember I told you that the, the EIA process is done in the context of one in applying for an environmental permit or a license. So it is not the EIA that is uh, approved. It is the permit that is uh, granted. So the EIA process is a part of the permit and license um, application process. Hope I'm clear. Maybe it is um, similar in your, in some of the other Caribbean countries. So just moving on to the linkages between planning and environmental. So it, it, the process is that there has to be a relationship or a link between planning and environment. And these are some of the ways in which those linkages are expressed. So the Town and Country Planning Act and the NRCA Act, they both make reference to each other. So the, 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 planning, the planning Act makes reference to environmental matters and the Natural Resources Conservation Authority Act make reference to planning matters. So therefore, in deciding on an application, all the planning parameters are assessed as well as the environmental parameters are addressed to come up with a decision. In terms of the agencies or the authorities that are involved in the process, in, two, in 2001, the NRCA, the Town and Country Planning Department, and the Land Development and Utilization Commission, these were three entities, and they were merged to create a, natural, a national environment and planning agency. Another instrument that is used to, um, there's a link that is used to protect um, the species is the National Spatial Plan. Now, the National Spatial Plan is an overall document that look at or determine how development should take place in a country or how the social services should be allocated. And this plan also ensure that areas are reserved for conservation that would um, protect the habitat of the different species, whether it is flora or fauna. Also, the development orders, these are documents, legal documents that provide guidance how development should take place in the country. And there are policies and proposals in these documents that again, protect wildlife and protect the species, whether it's flora and fauna in the country. There are also um, sustainable development plan as, as part of the process. These plans are done at a local level where more detailed planning and proposal for land use is done. There's also the protected area management and zoning plan. And again, areas are protected for different um, uses, whether it is conservation, um, species habitat protection. These are just some of the protected areas that we have in Jamaica. And within those areas, you have zoning plans that would determine how one, what activities can be done in a particular area. There's also the National Ecological Gap Assessment Report that also um, is a part of our planning and environmental process and that helped to guide how species and the ecology is dealt with. There's also the Biological Diversity Action Plan that, is, um, that we use in protecting or conserving our wildlife as it relates to um, protection or management of those resources. 
but the ultimate aim is sustainable development and therefore the planning and environmental issues are looked at in a holistic way to ensure that there is protection and conservation and good management of species. So basically, overall, the main goals of the environment and planning processes are to regulate development, protect and conserve, secure and coordinate, to inform and consult. And these are some of the ways in which it is done. For example, in terms of the regulation of development, we will have zoning plans and proposals, policies, development control. There are some areas that are delegated. Um, for example, in the Blue Mountains um, National Park, we delegate the Natural Resources Conservation Authority, delegate to a local NGO to manage that area. Monitor, we monitor, we enforce as applicable. In terms of conservation and protection, there are areas that are designated conservation areas. We use environmental bonds to, to protect our, um, as a protection tool or conservation tool as well. Um, monitoring and enforcement in terms of um, secure and coordinate, we ensure that the proper conditions are and conveniences are coordinated with the different entities, sector agencies and, and, um, and responsible agencies. As part of the process, consultation and information to the citizenry is important. So there are public notices from time to time, there are community meetings and there are mandatory public participation as in the EIA process where you have public presentation on all EIA. Now, if they if there's failure in the planning and environmental process, it will result in unsustainable development. You'll have species loss, decrease in the quality of life, including health. There will be economic stagnation and underdevelopment, as well as loss of research possibilities and new scientific discoveries. Therefore, we'll have to ensure that the process is successful to allow for sustainable development and um, good practices, which would improve the quality of life, improve our ecosystem, improvement in the population, and abundance of flora and fauna, as well as um, the, the acreage that are allocated for um, conservation and protection of these wildlife species. Also to improve economic growth and development. So just to recap that the planning and environmental process is uh, structured in a way as to protect, conserve, and manage the wildlife and other species that we have in Jamaica. And that's the end of my presentation. I know it was a lot, but I'm hoping that you would have at least learn or gather new information to maybe help you in your conservation efforts as well. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Blair, for a very informative presentation as well. We learned a lot about the process in Jamaica. Um, and I think we will move on. Uh, well, at this time, I'd like to see if we can administer the second poll while we prepare for the final uh, presenter. Um, so could the host kindly, yes, thank you very much. And if those in the audience would be so kind to complete this.
helpful, uh, it would be certainly uh, grateful. So we will turn to the next presenter, um, who is uh, Professor Chris Ura. Um, he is the a veterinary virologist, rather, at the UWA campus in St. Augustine, and he will present on the topic One Health Approach to Wildlife and Human Zoonotic Transmission Risk. Professor Ura received a Bachelor's of Veterinary Sciences from the Royal Veterinary College of the University of London. Soon, he, soon after, he completed a Master's in Tropical Veterinary Sciences from the Center for Tropical Veterinary Medicine at Edinburgh University in the UK and a PhD in Immunology from the Institute of Animal Health Purbright Laboratory in Surrey, UK. He is a professor of veterinary virology in the Department of Basic Veterinary Services at the UWI, where he leads a One Health based, uh, One Health based research program concentrating on zoonotic and animal pathogens of importance within the Caribbean region. His areas of research expertise are veterinary virology and infectious diseases, molecular diagnostics, virus discovery and evolution, molecular parasitology, vector-borne viral diseases, rather, population genetics, and molecular epidemiology and One Health. Professor Ura is the leading investigator on a number of projects from different funding agencies, such as UWI Trinidad and Tobago Research and Development Impact Fund, the UWI Research and Publications Fund, the European Commission, and the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, or ECA, among others. He is currently leading a One Health-based research program concentrating on zoonotic and animal pathogens of importance within the Caribbean region. Professor Ura has an outstanding record of published peer-reviewed articles and serves as an active member on many international and professional scientific societies. So without further ado, I present to you, Professor Ura. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. I hope you can see my slides. Can you see them, Kirk? Is that are they, can you see them all right? Yes, I can. Thanks very much. Great. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be very quick because I know there's um, not much time left and people have things to do. So I'm going to whiz through my slides um, very quickly so we have some time for uh, discussion. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a One Health approach to wildlife human zoonotic transmission risk. So changing the um, tack a little bit. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about One Health, just a small, I know we've had some, some information on that earlier. Talk a little about risk-based action um, to prevent um, viral spillover and uh, why the situation is getting worse and what we can do about it. And really reflecting a little bit at the end um, uh, on the series that we've all been a part of. And I'd like to sort of start with some key take home messages, which I'm so, sure everybody's on board with here. Um, domestic animals and wildlife, uh, we know and we've heard in this series, do play a very important role in spreading viruses to humans. And we know that 95% of new and emerging pathogens in humans have come through animals. However, there is a single species responsible for this. And that's us, that's humans. And recent pandemics like the COVID-19 pandemic have been a direct consequence of human activity. So we must not blame wildlife. I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here. Uh, we need um, to change our habits and customs as human beings. And we must learn from our experiences or worse will definitely happen. And it's not if, it's when. And in order to go about this, we need to do a number of things. But one of the big things is we need to, uh, to follow an interdisciplinary, collaborative, one health approach, because everything is connected. And if we don't do something about it, the situation is going to get worse. I show this slide um, to my students and I say, what of all these uh, viruses? I'm afraid I am a virologist, so you're going to get a little bit on viruses. Uh, what do all these viruses have in common, the ones we all know in the Caribbean? And this is, this is they all have come through animals as so many pathogens have. And we saw this uh, in one of the earlier um, sessions. We saw this, um, uh, this here and we see that um, there is spillover from wildlife. Um, it can be directly from wildlife into humans in some cases, or it can be 
from wildlife to domestic animals as an intermediate host and then to humans. And sometimes you get vectors, the ticks, the mosquitoes, um, uh, that they're involved as well. So this is what we have to try and stop, the spillover um, um, events. So what are the big lessons we need to learn? And I'm a vet, so I would say this, and, I'm, and I've been in animal science for a long time. And really when you see this picture here and you see this big, you see this big, um, sorry, um, you, you see this big um, uh, curve going up the middle, the bold one, that's the cost of an outbreak, the cost. And you see towards the left, when you have uh, exposure in animals or wildlife, the cost is really, really low. But when it gets into humans, and when humans start seeking medical care, um, as we've seen with this outbreak now, the cost is astronomical, uh, trillions of dollars. So we need to keep things to the left. And that's why we're here today. We're here to, to protect our wildlife and we're here, here to stop pathogens um, from passing across from wildlife through to animals into humans and causing this massive loss of life um, and, and um, a massive loss of money. And this is all about healthy people, healthy environment, healthy animals. This is the, everything is connected and we have to understand what that and when we make these decisions. Why is the situation getting worse? Well, we've talked about some of this today and throughout the series. We see, we see uncontrolled deforestation and forest encroachment. So humans are coming into contact with wildlife. We're seeing very close association between humans and animals. Um, uh, in often which is directed by poverty. We're seeing these wild meat markets. We're seeing high density of human populations, high density of animal populations in intensive agriculture. And we live in a globalized society. So everything is being rushed around the world um, extremely quickly. So when you look from a point of view of how you're going to, um, how you're going to uh, undergo risk-based action, um, you can ask many questions and we all know about how to do risk assessments and you start at the source and you come to where uh, or, or where it's coming to so you have to you have to think are zoonotic diseases present and likely to emerge in your country you have to think are zoonotic diseases present and likely to emerge in neighboring countries and could they pass to you are the hot spots close to you are wildlife and domestic animals present in your country that are susceptible to these zoonotic pathogens? Um, and are vectors present that can transmit them? And finally at the bottom, is there that connection between the animals and the humans, such as through hunting or wildlife? Is that connection there? So those, uh, the, the, those zoonotic diseases are capable of them passing on to humans. And this is from um, more of a Trinidad perspective, but it would be possible, uh, but it, it, would, it would be important to do this with all countries. And you can see in the yellow here, and Kirk showed this picture earlier, the hot spots um, that correlate with emerging zoonotic diseases. And this, these yellow spots, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, um, they are close to us in Trinidad. So this is the areas of the world where they've modeled uh, very carefully and they've, they've, they've They've, they've uh, um, identified them as hotspots and that's very close to us. And of course, we have lots and lots of illegal trade, I'm afraid, of wildlife, especially with the, with the, with the economic situation in Venezuela that's happening at the moment in Trinidad. And these are just pictures we're, we're seeing of these uh, awful pictures. We've seen some lovely, lovely pictures today, and I'm afraid I'm going to show you some bad ones. Um, and this is the illegal trade of wildlife. Not only bad for the wildlife, bad for conservation, but also bad for us because it's potentially bringing in pathogens that can, can pass across. And we, for example, in Trinidad and Tobago, as we've heard today in other countries, have plenty of wildlife, a real rich diversity, many, many bat species, many, many bird species, many, many rodent species. And of course, uh, bottom left, we can see this guy, which is probably responsible for the yellow fever outbreak. Uh, and we have these howler monkeys as well. We also have, as we saw today, many wildlife that we eat. Um, um, so, so we have a very close close uh, proximity to these when we're hunting, when we're eating. So this is potentially getting these uh, viruses across into humans. And we mustn't forget our skies and we mustn't forget our oceans and our rivers. We're on various migratory bird paths. And of course, we're thinking about influenza here. 
Um, we see this in the USA, and of course, we're on migratory paths straight down to us in the Caribbean. We must, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we must also remember our oceans uh, and our waterways. And this is a terrible example which were, uh, of this uh, horrible bacteria, Edwardsiella ectura, which came across in, um, in, in catfish uh, imported into Trinidad. Um, and they weren't inspected properly. The, the, the bacteria came across, and this is a potentially only incredible, incredibly serious economic importance coming from Asia, from India to the Caribbean. We have to avoid this. And this is, of course, biosecurity, what we're here to talk about. And of course, I'm afraid the situation, we have to get hold of it because with climate change, as we've heard in for, me, for many of the speakers, the situation is going to get worse. So just to finish off, I wanted to reflect a little bit on some of the, uh, on the series a little bit and talk about managing the risks of disease emergence in the wildlife trade and the critical points going forward and where, what we can concentrate our time and effort on because we don't have, uh, human resources and, and, and finances are in short supply in many, uh, in many countries. So I just wanted to, to just thought about a, a few things that, that just to summarize them. The first is increased awareness of what is out there. Um, and this is really surveillance. We need to be able to increase the transparency and consistency of surveillance um, and reporting to ensure legal trade routes remain available because we have to support our legal trade, uh, but not our illegal trade. And this will provide foresight uh, on early warning systems, early warnings and emerging threats. And we can do this in three ways. We need to understand the supply chain properly, which animals, whether they come from uh, where do they go, what comes into the country, and this helps us to prioritize such as our diagnostics and our surveillance. And we need to invest in wildlife life surveillance. Um, and this means not just having access to pe people who, who know how to diagnose, but what Dr. Supal was saying earlier, we need a network of people who can find and submit samples, because this is critical in, 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 in wildlife surveillance. And we need to access people who can turn surveillance data into risk management information because you know the wildlife trade is different to the domestic animal trade and you can't necessarily take somebody from the ministry of agriculture or the vet school and say um, you can interpret this surveillance you need people who really understand the wildlife trade of the wildlife industry to be able to do that so was mentioned earlier by uh, Ricardo, legislation is so critical to protect, to protect our wildlife and also to protect the spillover of viruses. We need to assess the risk and, and work on a risk basis, like I talked about earlier, and this is assessing the risk of legal and illegal trade. And we need to consider how to reduce supply and demand for wildlife and wildlife meat. And possibly also, and critically also, we need to pr promote harmonization, taking a regional approach and promote a one health interdisciplinary approach, working together, as was also mentioned by Ricardo, this is absolutely, absolutely critical. And my final slide was just a, just a few things to consider going forward in reflection to the series. Um, we really need to develop strategies related to, uh, to, to, to which are unique to the Caribbean, taking into consideration the local context and take advantage of what we have in the Caribbean. Caribbean. We've heard about our incredibly rich biodiversity, our potential for ecotourism, our rich wildlife. We need to take advantage of that going forward. And we need to create capacity for adaptive management. We need to learn and adapt along the way. We need to be flexible in a cha changing conditions and needs. And this is especially the case because we're going to be learning so much from COVID-19. And on the same way, we need to start with a good logic model. We need to understand our desired outcomes. Too many people just, just, just say we we'll want to do surveillance with, and they don't have a strong idea of what actions they intend to affect. So we really need to understand our outcomes and we need to monitor and evaluate our outcomes along the way so we can prove that what we do is successful uh, and we're really making a difference and this is absolutely critical and I think finally my last uh, point is it's very hard to budget programs just for wildlife so we need to look to build a multi-solving approach looking at other uh, issues that are happening at the moment, big issues like um, like climate change, like um, like zoonotic disease preparedness and pandemic prevention and conservation, these big areas that are all linked into this, bringing this in to really pull together a very a very 
um, uh, detailed and, 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 and uh, uh, um, type of program that brings in wildlife, but brings in all these other things. And that will maximize chances of getting funding um, um, and moving this process forward. So I'm, I'm sorry, that was pretty quick. Um, I hope I'm sort of within the 10 minutes. Um, and thank you very much for listening. So over to you, Kirk. Thanks very much, Professor Ura, um, for a very riveting presentation and informative as well, even though it was brief. And I want to open the floor for anyone who wants to pose any questions, any question in the answer section, because interacting with our audience is definitely something that we would want to do. And I had seen a few questions in the question and answer regarding um, DNA and genetic um, testing. Um, this is something that we are considering for the initiative because we recognize it as a, a gap within the, the region in terms of how we would be able to identify species. Also, um, I think one question asks about the hybridization of a number of different species due to the introduction of invasive alien species and what potential that had in terms of disrupting or destabilizing our ecosystems. So I think that just in fact, DNA um, genotyping and sequencing would definitely be helpful in um, assisting us in our environmental management uh, processes. I think we have uh, just oh, just 10 more minutes left um, to have this particular event. And so if you guys do have any more questions, you can let us know, or I will just see if we can have a brief panel discussion just to um, address one or two, one question. We only have time for one. So um, since I don't see any new, new um, answer, uh, questions in the chat, I'll just ask the panelists to see if they can uh, respond to the open questions in the Q&A section. Um, and we can see if we can start the question the panel discussion rather. So this is the panel discussion question I want to pose. Uh, I think Professor Ura has started to touch on it, um, but I would want to get the, the input from some of the other panelists. What are the current gaps for the Caribbean in our wildlife human relationship from a public health, maybe a conservation, human development and uh, agriculture or food safety perspective. And I'll start with Professor Horrocks. Could you weigh in um, on this particular question? Hi, Kirk, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, well, just focusing on the, um, on the conservation aspects, um, there are several things that I think we need to um, try to address um, and First of all, I would say that we need to give greater protection to the species and habitats that remain. Um, and, you know, given that um, most of us in the region, if not all, are signatories to the Convention on Biological Diversity, you know, and committed to having 17% of our land area um, in protected areas um, by 2020. Um, and of course, many of us have, have not reached that target. Some have and have gone up above, but still we need to do more in terms of protection um, and we need to look at restoration as well because uh, you know less than 30 percent of the forests remain and we're going to basically have to try to look at uh, different ways in which we can get rid of invasive species um, you know reintroduce uh, native species uh, reforest um, do, do those kinds of sort of remediation type type work. Um, and I think also we have to, you know, and others have mentioned this already, we have to do more to pre prevent the arrival of uh, invasive species coming into the Caribbean region. Um, I think we need to, you know, we need to be more stringent. We need to be looking at having a clean list policy rather than a dirty list policy where, you know, nothing is allowed in unless it's been demonstrated to be um, a non-invasive species. 
And I think we need, you know, there's an environmental education component too. We need to, uh, we need more education. We need, we need to um, get the people in the region to appreciate and to develop a pride and, and sense of awareness about the amazing biodiversity that we have in the region. So those would be the main elements, I think. Thank you very much for that. And um, here at the center, we will be, in terms of the education and training, we will be offering three courses, um, which will be available shortly, um, which will address a number of the issues that we have touched on throughout the course of these events that we have staged. So you can um, look out for communication from us with respect to the specifics of those courses. Um, there will be 15 hours in length, um, well, contact hours um, on, on a number of different issues, money laundering, illegal wildlife trade, um, and also the impact on tourism and also agriculture and one health and um, the infectious disease aspect as well. So you can certainly look out for that. And we have our biosecurity um, course as well as the sharp professional courses. I also wanted to get a way in from Ricardo in terms of the, the impact that you would see the current gap, sorry, um, for human our human wildlife relationship um, from, I would say, the human development um, perspective. OK, thank you, Dr. Douglas. So gaps are, are many. <laughs> gaps are many, but I, I'll try to narrow it down. I, I realize based on you know, working at the agency over the years, the wildlife trade is somewhat unregulated, the legal wildlife trade. The legislation, in my opinion, is not strong enough to, 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 um, to really get a hold of, of you know, pet shops and, and things like that. And in recent times, it's almost as if it's a to have an exotic animal. And so there is this need for persons wanting things like monkeys, a parrot that no one else has. So it would be really exotic, not just their yellow meat that you find in the pet trade, but we've seen things like Red Lord Amazons, um, you know, monkeys and, and macaws and those things. And so I, I think there is this disconnect where persons are not seeing the environmental wildlife for what it is, but what it can do for them and for them only. And so if we need to, if we are to address some of these issues, we need to increase the public education program, for example, for persons to appreciate the wildlife for what it is. You mentioned that I'm a member of BirdLife Jamaica, and that is something that we do where we try to get persons out into environment and see a parrot, see a bird in the forest, and not wanting it in their house and knowing that they can go out in the forest at any time and see these birds. Um, they can never get tired of them. If they get tired, you go home, right? So it's, it's the gap I, I see is, is this public education. We probably need to get it you know, all the way down into the, into the school system for persons to have this appreciation. We are looking at it through very biased lens because we chose you know, environmental sciences coming up. So we were seeing something on a very different light, but persons who are, you know, oblivious are, are very disconnected from the environment, need a connection at an earlier stage on a more fundamental basis, on a more structured basis, not just haphazard, but for example, through the school system. And as, as they go forward, as I say, you know, it's like a status symbol. I see it now going over into even the legal things like, like hunting. You know, it's hunting is now becoming like an advocacy for persons to have what I would say the, the, the wrong interaction with the environment. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of hunters who are very conscious and very conservative minded. And, you know, and they, they, they would put out a lot of effort in conserving the species that they love to hunt outside of the hunting season. But at the same time, the, the hunting fraternity is, is so, so loud, you know, it's so present that persons are seeing that as where they want to be. It's, it's also a, a status symbol and, and so forth. So I, I think along with the, with the PR, 
we need to get it into the schools and we need to look at things like the pet trade and see how we can actually you know, better manage it and put even legislation in place to, 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 um, to manage this, this issue. Great, thanks very much. And I, on the legislation note, I think that's something that we will also be looking at. Um, we've been reviewing a lot of the Caribbean wildlife legislation and we are hoping to put together a checklist and also a legislative brief um, to be to be a, a source of recommendations for persons within the different um, sectors. And I see Ms. Blair, you want to chime in here. Uh, would you give us a, a perspective on um, urban planning and, and rural planning? And what are the gaps you think in, that are, well, the gaps that are, exist and what is needed to close those gaps um, for Caribbean relief? Well, just to basically to add to Ricardo's point about um, public education and awareness, and to suggest that the use of technology be incorporated, non-conventional use of, um, you know, introduction of new technology to assist in monitoring, which is very important because um, we don't have the bodies to physically be present at, these sites or in these habitats. So we need to find new ways of carrying out monitoring activities. That's, um, you know, introduce, introduction of new technology into the system to close that gap, to be able to have a handle on that situation, as well as monitoring the outcome, as someone had mentioned earlier. Instead of the output, we look at outcomes. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much as well. And Professor Ura, I'll give you probably about two minutes to weigh in um, because I know you had already presented on the gaps. Yes, I mean, I, I think one of the some of the biggest gaps from from, from uh, that we have from a sort of virus perspective is is is, is in the diagnosis. Um, if you can't if you can't diagnose it that what you, that your problem you don't do anything about it you just sit on it you know um and that's the problem not just with wildlife um, diseases but domestic animal diseases and sometimes even human diseases because of the lack of capacity and capability to be able to diagnose what's causing the problem because then after that you know you you do all your actions and and and, and it, it, it it informs everything else uh, and you know transparency as i mean sometimes i have to say you know there's a head in the sand attitude uh, if you don't know you don't have to do anything about it but we have to change that attitude to we must know because knowledge is is everything um, we can actually do something about it if we know um, and part and so research is critical but 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 before that diagnosis being able to being able to diagnose and new technologies, as 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 the previous speaker said, new technologies in diagnostics. We've seen all the PCR and all that kind of stuff, molecular diagnosis, characterization. You know, that kind of stuff is critical, and we really lack it in many many Caribbean countries. Thank you very much. And I think that will conclude our session today. And I just want to thank all of the presenters who would have presented today, and also the presenters that presented in the preceding uh, webinars and panel discussions, and to all the persons who would have joined us to uh, participate in these webinar series. And we thank you for your support, and we thank you for your attendance as well, and your interaction um, throughout this entire month. Um, I just want to also thank the principal of the UWI KFO campus, uh, Professor Eugene Barato, also the advisory committee of the Center for Biosecurity Studies, uh, Professor Troy Lord, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, um, also the entire Marcoms team and the team from SITS as well, who have been so instrumental in connecting us and pro providing the platform for us to um, have these sessions. And also uh, Dr. Dion Greenwich at CPDLL for um, facilitating the 
courses and offering these sharp professional courses. Um, Mr. Uh, sorry, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Jones, also the Executive Director of CARICOM Impacts and his entire team as we are continue to work on the Caribbean wildlife um, crime database as, as one of the major objectives of this initiative. I also want to thank um, C4 and Dr. Natalie Van Vliet, who we will be partnering with to be conducting some pilot studies, uh, well meat studies in Trinidad and Tobago, and also in Jamaica, um, which will be facilitated by NEPA. Uh, also Dr. Eric Eater from the CARVET, and Dr. Barcos, Luis Barcos from the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE, um, Mr. Jorge Rios from the UNODC, and also Mr. Vincent Sweeney from uh, the U United Nations Environment Program, or UNEP. And there are several other persons who would have contributed to this, including the panelists and those who support us. And we will resume in from next month our um, meetings that we had preceding the, this month of activity. So I just wanted to flag that for all of those who um, have enjoyed it and have contributed that we will resume in there. So again, I thank you all for joining us and I will turn over the proceedings to uh, Christiane. Thank you, Director, and for that very comprehensive thanks. We've had quite a full discussion this afternoon and appropriately so for the last panel presentation. Uh, fortunately, we know that we've lost a few viewers in the last a uh, few minutes, um, and we're very aware that, you know, this virtual environment is making several demands on everyone's time, multiple Zoom meetings, homeschooling, national curfews to be mindful of as everyone tries to undertake various personal transactions during a very narrow window of time, among other priorities, and certainly we don't want to abuse the privilege of having had your time this afternoon. So once again, to stay connected with the Center for Biosecurity Studies, please email us or visit us online. And those particulars were posted in the Q&A window. So we invite you to take note of them before we adjourn. And we are currently curating content for the next edition of the Center's newsletter in which you'll be able to find more information about the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative. And we also welcome any interested contributors who are keen to add to this discourse. In the next edition, you'll also find updates, as the director mentioned, on plans for upcoming short courses. So be sure to get your content to us as soon as possible if you'd like to make a submission for our next publication. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the team here at the Center for Biosecurity Studies, we thank each and every one of you once again for following this series, Living a Wildlife, Catch Me If You Can, over this past month. It was our hope, certainly, that it has been as informative for you as it was designed to be. And we look forward to more opportunities in the future where we can continue to develop these discussions and report on the status of the goals and objectives of the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative. Thank you for viewing, and we wish you a good afternoon. The session is now adjourned. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone.